Uh, thank you. Any clarifying questions? I'll, and meanwhile, I'll invite all of our speakers to come up to the table here. Have a seat up here. If we could turn the slides off, that'd be great. And I am going to remind people to um, introduce yourselves as well as to speak very closely to the mic. There's been some difficulty with uh, voices and sound kind of drifting off. So I would like to open this to any comments, questions. Yes, sir. Dos Kumar from University of Memphis. I think this was a, a great session. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, my question is about the patient engagement. So uh, uh, there were several comments made uh, today about how are we going to ensure adherence? Uh, I mean, some people are enthusiastic about collecting their own data, understanding their data, but not everybody will be. So how do we get patients, everyone in this entire cohort to be engaged? And so returning the data back to the participants is, is great. Uh, I mean, uh, but uh, in what form should the data be returned to participants? What benefits should participants get precisely because the share meaning that are there some benefits that they would get only because they are able to share? And if they get those benefits, at what stage do they get what benefits and uh, can it have any adverse impact on their own health? These are some questions that I certainly find to, be, to have uh, some trade-offs and I would like to hear panelists' views. Thank you. Sharon? So I'll start, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Dixie and Andrea both have uh, things to add. So I don't think this is going to be monolithic either. I don't think we're going to have one size fits all of what people want back and how they want it. And I think we've had some very good experiments we should look into, and, and some are uh, 23andMe. Um, I'm a participant in that, and I like the way they give me data back. Uh, some of it compares me to my own age group, my own ethnicity, et cetera. On the other hand, something like um, patients like me allows me or whomever to see how I stack up in terms of my health status. Those are two different ways of looking at the world, and I think they're important for different people for different reasons. I think also what do we return is going to have to be a societal conversation and one that we haven't had too many um, participants part of. Uh, so, for example, I am a member of the American College of Medical Genetics, but wasn't part of the group of people who decided what will be returned and when. Um, I think those kinds of conversations could be more open, and I do get that the professional societies might have a limited interest, but I think we need those conversations more broadly. Um, and then I think we also need to start to play with and look at other ways that we, in our own environments, get data back to us. Um, I can go on Angie's list and look at certain things. I can go on Consumer Reports and look at other things. Uh, people like those dashboards, and I think we can start doing that, and that will inspire some people to be compliant or to adhere. I think another example is Flu Near You does a really nice job of just once a week asking you, <clears throat> do you have a uh, scratchy throat today? Um, and you can map that as well. Thank you. I think we really need to, um, in this next step when we're asking patients what they want, we need to make them in every way part of the design process. So that includes letting them build, letting them design. And you know, I don't have a definitive answer for what needs to be returned back because every <coughs> single community and every single participant is going to feel differently about it. So I think there are going to be common things. You know, when I look at my perspective in genetics and and what I'm learning about BRCA1, there are some very common themes that I think that could carry over from my community to the CF community, and we could brainstorm together. The key is what I think is focusing on this idea of e-patients or the patients who really have used technology in ways that are effective um, and making sure that we're asking them the questions first. Okay, I have Mark, then Rory. Um, I think that uh, the talks have been very good in terms of focusing a lot of the um, uh, weaknesses that uh, we've had as researchers in terms of engaging participant communities. And we are also, see I was paying attention here. Um, I think we have a, a, a countervailing issue which is, at least in this country, uh, the idea of autonomy trumping everything. And I think in earlier discussions we've heard about 
uh, the impact of having only selected part uh, people participating in these and how that could really impact um, uh, what we're able to learn from this type of a, of a study. I mean, we've only, we only have to look at the measles issue to see what autonomy uh, can do if you opt out of what is a public health uh, issue. So the question I would come back to, and I certainly don't have any solution for this, is is there a way to craft a expectation of a population of participants? And I think we've seen some of this in terms of the special handling of quality improvement within healthcare systems where, you know, we're allowed to use all data to be able to uh, try and improve the services that we're delivering to people. Is there a model like that that could be used in this type of a setting so we don't have autonomy ultimately bringing <clears throat> this down? So I'll take a shot at that. So I think about a lot about that because I think we could do a couple things. I think we can encourage a more collective thought around health that we don't in general, about anything in the US really. Um, and so I think we want to think about how can we do that. And so what does I belong look like in, in this project, for example? Will there be, and we think about this in PCORnet, you know, should we have some kind of branding to belong? And what is that? And I, I think that's going to have to be pretty locally based still because I do believe it's going to be communities that will, will formulate these things. Um, I I think the other thing is we want to start looking at um, how uh, do we stimulate whole communities to do this. So I look at things like Walmart employees or uh, gyms or churches, you know, that those have identities that like to contribute and usually like to contribute in some kind of collectives, very different kinds of collectives, but what do those collectives look like and how can we begin to move those forward as well. Um, and then I think the last thing is, I think the um, quality improvement stuff is a good example, and we will uh, probably wind up in some trouble like we have with care.data in the, at the NHS. In other words, when people don't know the two secrets that I think the medical system has not told them, one, your doctor doesn't know everything. That's okay, but I need to know that. And two, you're the answer actually to that. If we could start to couple those two messages without undermining people's trust in the medical system and all the other pushbacks I get when I say that, um, I think people will feel more inclined instead of winding up at the drugstore on the third drug that isn't working and get that actually my data is an answer to me not going through this again. Okay, I have, well, go ahead. Sorry, Tracy. Dixie, I think you yeah, just pressed the, the little ah, face thing. In the middle. Yeah, I, I think I, I think we have a general problem with that. I, I think we do a great job of we tend to communicate health in terms of the individual, and we we really do overlook how how uh, population health affects the individual, you know, and and uh, the benefits to us as individuals of keeping populations healthy. I think that this, this whole initiative could be very helpful in changing that whole mindset because I think that that particular problem is, you know, is a major problem. And, and I think this, this can certainly help address it. It's a good, good, good point, I thought. Okay, I have Rory, Dave, Kathy, Claudia, and there was one back here I missed, and I have Seek. I'm sorry, okay, you're in the queue? Okay, two, uh, Rory. Uh, Rory Collins, Oxford. I really like the idea of getting away from the word consent um, and moving towards something around um, agreement to participate and being part of it. Um, with respect to then what we're asking people to do, I, I'm not convinced that either broad consent is a bad idea or that sort of or broad agreement and dynamic agreement is a good idea. Um, so, I mean, our experience in the UK Biobank study was that people took, didn't take part for a whole range of reasons, but it wasn't because we had broad consent. That was not a reason for not taking part. Um, and, um, uh, however, as we did additional studies, um, people had the option of taking part in those. So they could provide more and more information. And I think that, that goes to this issue around dynamic agreement to participate, that you have a lot of opportunities to participate more and more as one enhances the cohort. And if we keep people informed about what they're participating in, they always have the option to say enough. Um, so in the VA study and UK Biobank study, I think that people can always say, I don't want to be part of this. 
However, in, among half a million people, we've had fewer than 2,000 over a 10-year period who've said, we don't want to continue on in the study, most of whom said, you can keep my data, you can keep on following me up, I just don't want to hear from you anymore because I'm too ill or whatever. Um, so I just wonder whether there's a risk that we make things less feasible um, by uh, having compl more complex things where, you, where we don't have a broad consent at the beginning um, <clears throat> and where we, we try to make it all things to all men and women um, when that's probably not necessary. I think, I guess from my perspective, it depends on where we're starting. You know, if we're collecting genomic data, then no, I don't think just having a broad consent is gonna work. I mean, I, I really strongly feel that we have to give participants this, this sense that their data is not secure if we go that way. I mean, we have to make sure that we're honest with people and let them know that there's gonna be a risk and a benefit that they have to weigh. For me, um, I'm very public about my mutation status and the risks for me don't outweigh the benefits. I want to participate because of that. I want to share my data. Um, but, you know, I think for other things where we're collecting phenotypic information and it's just a, a low-level study, I mean, yeah, that could definitely have a, a much less rigorous consent process. Can, can I just clarify? Yes, you I, may. I, I, I didn't mean that um, the data are then freely uh, available. I mean, you, you certainly have to have careful controls over access to the data. The question is, given those controls around security and who can access it and for what, um, uh, that uh, um, allowing researchers to, to do all sorts of different things, not constrain their imagination um, at the beginning to how they might use those data to improve health. That, that was really what I was meaning. So, Rory, that's why, uh, and I didn't have time to go over them, our columns essentially, the first column is discover. My de-identified, Dixie would say limited data set, not de-identified, um, to be precise. Um, it, it, that's to allow hypothesis generating the kind of discovery, that sort of thing. The second column said export and use my data, and the third column said contact me. So it's ever increasing levels of engagement essentially by the participant and allows that kind of dynamism. What we're finding is 85% of individuals say allow, 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 allow. Another 10% say, ask me in a few places, and 5% have said deny. So very similar to, to your results. And we're not saying we're not in favor of broad consent. We're not in favor of anything. We're giving people the opportunity to make those decisions. Yeah, I think that this, and I work, I work with Sharon on the, on the peer project. Um, and I think it's really important that if we really want wide engagement, that we have to recognize that the graph, the curve, uh, that, that, she dem that she showed, and there are some people who will let their information to be used for anything, there are some people who will not let their information be used for anything at all, and then there are all of these people in between. And if we offer them the options, the kind of options that, that Sharon's system, the peer system uh, provides, we actually allow every single person to play. And as they gain trust, which they will, you know, as they gain trust over time, and we know that they do, you know, they will, they will be more willing to let their information, be more free with giving their, giving their permissions. Um, but I think that if, it's important for us to create the environment so that everybody can play. I also think with respect to the question about engagement, I think we also need to recognize that not everybody's going to want to be engaged in the same way either. You know, and over time, they will be, wanna, be wanting to come in and out of their engagement. And if we really want them involved, we have to recognize these differences and how those differences are dynamic. Okay, Dave. I have everybody's whose hands up, so I do have you written down. Dave Kaufman, NHGRI. Um, just two quick things, Sharon, a quick follow-up. I'm just wondering if you have any data about um, uh, the people who say maybe. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've asked them uh, about it, participating in enough kinds of studies to see do they generally, when, when they're asked for, you know, study one, two, three, four, and five, do they generally say yes? Is it just, like you said, about asking if you can use your bicycle? And, and uh, then my second question is just um, for the whole group, uh, you know, in, in sort of the spirit of Sharon's, uh, um, you know, uh, 
let us make mistakes, is a reasonable place for us to uh, engage people as we uh, ask about this initiative and, and, and privacy, is, is a reasonable place to start. Um, we're going to do our best to you know, enact all the principles that, that, that Dixie enumerated, but we can't guarantee your privacy. And, and, and is that a reasonable place to start asking people you know, what they think about, our, about protecting privacy in this context? I want to jump all over that one because I think that's absolutely where we need to be because we cannot guarantee privacy and we cannot guarantee security and we need to make that crystal clear to everybody. And I think for the ask me question, um, we are being studied right now. We're actually invited DCRI, do Clinical Research Institute, thank you, Rob, Caleb, um, to study us. So we're going to see what, what are we doing and what are the participants doing that's ethical or not ethical and what are their uh, concerns. Anecdotally, so far we've seen that people say yes when asked. Nobody said no at all. Um, and then the other um, opportunity we have is we have an ethics team that works with Genetic Alliance and Genetic Alliance is IRB and they're both going to study us under the Robert Wood Johnson Grant. So we hope to have information about both of those. Okay, Kathy? I think this question actually is for you, Pearl. So this morning when you did the, yeah. So <laughs> listen. Okay. this morning when you did your working group report, you um, had as one of your recommendations that in building the cohort and running the cohort that there should be a patient engagement group or committee. And I, I was going to ask you about it then, and I definitely want to ask you about it now, especially in light of Andrea's <clears throat> comment about, and Sharon's comment about not just being at the table or being at another table, really, right? So we'll put the children over it's there, different. and they, yeah. and we'll check that box and say that we actually had them engaged. Shouldn't they just be a part of the whole process from the get-go? I mean, why do we want to have a separate you know, silo them off and, and feel like we've taken care of those issues rather than just integral to the governance and planning. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, kind of the intent of all of those quote committees was really to have everyone there. But I think in terms of, there are some committees, I think there are some where participants, we need specific issues that a heavier participant panel could help us with, such as, you know, what works for recruitment, what works in terms of modalities for return, but to, I guess to have it all into a mothership of a equally over, you know, uh, governing body. In fact, I would argue that, I mean, I think this whole process, I think um, participants should not just plan the meal, they need to bring the food. And I think this whole big cohort thing should be a more partnership. I think it coming from, I mean, it's both good and bad that it was part of the State of the Union, but we do have some problems as soon as potential participants see an informed consent form that says this will be shared on a federal database. No, and they walk away. So I think the importance of this, if we could get a more public, private, you know, um, engagement, get, oops, participants, I'm always already also confused of what P words I can use, but. You know, to really get participants at the table. So this is our cohort, I think would be incredibly important. It, there are a lot of times, though, that when uh, researchers <laughs> start a project that they do, in fact, sort of feel like they've taken care of the patient subject mm -hmm. issues by having a little subcommittee, but it, it operates in parallel rather than actually in an integrated way. Right, and I, th I think we need to rectify that. Can I add a few things to that? I mean, I, I think that one thing to start with is we have to do things differently with this cohort. We can learn from existing things within existing cohorts, but if there was one thing when I talked to patients that they said they wanted to be different about how the NIH carries this board, it's you don't just hang out your shingle and say, we're going to create a focus group and ask what patients want. We're going to let patients design it from the get-go and have them be part of the funding decisions and have them be part of the learning process. It's clear that we don't speak the same language all the time, and there's going to be a huge learning curve for us, but that, that is part of the risk-taking, I think. Okay, Claudia? Um, three, a couple quick observations and a question. Um, one is that I've heard a concern that there's actually a lot of research that goes on today through waivers that people, that participants don't necessarily know about, 
and a concern that if we start having these open conversations, um, just will we be able to continue doing that? So I, I don't have an answer to that, and I actually think it's a legitimate uh, question. That's one just observation. Another one is that I think sometimes our approaches to um, whether it's IRBs or privacy um, are from the philosophy that we're protecting patients from sort of from themselves as well as from outside threats. And there will be patients that want to participate in openly sharing their data. We see this from the Personalized Genome Project. So I think as we go forward, we also have to imagine scenarios where patients actually want to do things that we're uncomfortable with. And, and yet, that may be a choice that we want to enable openly. So that's just a second observation. A third is um, just, I th as this morning's gone forward, I've just really been struck that we need a lot of sort of rapid, a iterative A-B testing of different things. And so I'm um, just wondering for, for ourselves as we think about this effort, how can we use the next several months to sort of test hypotheses in a really rapid way? And, uh, and so the question is um, to Sharon, um, so a part of PCORI was an explicit engagement of patient-powered networks. And I'm curious to know what two or three observations you have about how they're different and um, what's worked and what hasn't worked and how we should think about building on that um, model of patients as the, the governors for nodes or whatever, whatever that's going to end up being as we move forward in this work. Terrific question. So <clears throat> I don't think the experiment's done yet um, by any means, but I, what I've observed is that the uh, patient-powered research networks, which is what PCORI is calling these, um, have been more facile to do some things and not so facile in other things. Um, so not surprisingly, not a panacea of what we would hope uh, in terms of engagement. I think some of them have the same kinds of problems that bigger institutions do and there's a kind of bureaucracy within them because of their either age or size. Um, some of them, they're really interesting in the sense that they're quite diverse. So some have been uh, long-time advocacy organizations run by people all along that are working together, uh, I mean, working within that community. And some are put up by investigators who have now done this in a much more participant-centric way. So I think there's been learnings on both sides. I think the other thing is um, looking at how do we move beyond specific conditions is one of the things I'm fascinated with. And I'm hoping that in phase two of PCORnet, we do look at what if we cascade from the probands that are in these groups. We don't really just care about people with PXE, happens to be the disease my kids have, or you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We care about that their, their families may have obesity or diabetes or you know, other issues that we should be also enrolling them for, so to speak. And I think those probands are really great uh, doorways or entrances to a large cohort. So I think we're starting to learn what does that mean and how are we going to cascade out. Um, and that isn't that we've decided to do that as a whole group yet, uh, but I think it is stuff that we're thinking about. Okay. See? Say Catherine from Mass General Hospital. Um, so getting back to this idea of what are the major questions that this one million person research cohort is needed for, uh, one could, of course, be to understand the genetic basis of, of rare disease, uh, and CF has been mentioned a few times, uh, but even in a, in a million person cohort, assuming a one in 10,000 person, uh, one in 10,000 prevalence, you'll have 100 people with CF in this, or diseases like it in this cohort. So I wonder whether um, uh, the idea of a, of a, a disease-based community, Sharon, in terms of uh, adding in kind of disease mod modules where, where patients and communities, that, you know, that, that suffer these diseases can be brought in and essentially be able to compare the d disease participants to the reference group, which might be a large part of the rest of the cohort, because that could be a, a very valuable interaction. So my opinion would be yes, uh, and that those loci, because they, that's what they would be, are, are captive audiences who have been dedicated in trust communities for a long time. I think the right kind of partnership with them, with us, um, because I run one of those, it's 20 years old this month, we are ready to do that and go beyond just those probands. Um, I, I think that's one 
part of this. I also think we do need to get beyond traditional advocacy, brick and mortar advocacy, because we're being overrun by the affinity groups that are waking up on Facebook, waking up in Twitter. Those are way more powerful. I mean, Andrea's um, experiment in advocacy is really all online. It isn't a brick and mortar advocacy organization in a traditional way. So I think we want to make sure in the cohort that we're, we're also working with communities that are virtual, communities that are new, communities that are using new modalities. Okay, Tim O'Leary. Tim O'Leary, VA. Uh, just a couple of observations uh, on, on um, consent agreement, whatever, and the limitations. Uh, we've run a lot of clinical trials over time, which have had uh, biospecimens and other things uh, consented. And one of the challenges that we have sometimes uh, when investigators want to repurpose specimens or data and so forth is actually uh, trying to figure out where the limited consent that was given at the time of that trial actually ends. And what you see is that sometimes people are trying to push the edges, uh, sometimes even cleverly push past the edges, in my opinion, but there's diversity. And I think it's something that one needs to think about in moving forward in this. The second is like it. I'm, I'm dealing with an issue now, I won't go into the details, but it involves a small group of patients who basically have, have given a consent which some people believe means that data should actually probably be destroyed at this point. But there is an advocacy group that would include as a subset the people that actually participated that believes it's a terrible thing to actually destroy data with regards to this population. And so this, this uh, dichotomy that I heard described earlier between uh, the common wheel and autonomy uh, brings itself up. I think in the end, some place or another, one will have to find a middle ground but be very careful about carefully defining where that is because it's that careful definition, I think, that facilitates the trust that I agree with you all is what is really critical in making this go forward. No, I would just comment that I think in those cases we need to do some kind of engagement uh, and sometimes we can't engage the original group of people but we could engage surrogates for that group and, and the most startling example of this to me is that the state of Texas had to destroy five million blood spots because four families thought their privacy had been breached. Did they really have the conversation they needed in Texas with all the other families? And no, we won't reach a perfect solution because it will be different for every family but we need to at least have a a kind of communal conversation. Okay, we have a question from the web and then I will get back to the group here. Great, so I'm gonna turn the conversation a little bit and talk about returning data to people. Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so I, it's been going on for days. Um, so the question from the WebEx is, what are the major barriers to giving participants complete access to the data they provide to research studies? Okay, barriers for returning all the data from a research study to participants. Well, I think some um, organizations do this really well and some do not. I, I imagine that there are ethical barriers at times, um, but I, I would take 23andMe, for example. They give you your raw data back, and that is a huge trust builder. Um, you know, other barriers I think are giving patients ways to understand that data once it's given back to us and returned. You know, is it just going to be a uh, raw sequence that we can share with other people? How do we push it to other people? Um, so yeah, sorry. I would also add. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here. I think um, embedded in that question is also the issue of defining what kind of research study we're talking about. Yeah. If you're talking like a phase one new drug study, um, you know, it, it's, it's a context of what is that data as opposed to, you know, a study that's focused toward a particular condition. Um, I think there are also somewhat fears if it is a, um, I know you can't use blinded anymore, but if you have two groups of people getting different things, um, the fear of actually when you return, do you break um, the study design? I think there are issues of, and what do you do with that information? You need to annotate it, you need to put it in context. And I think those are all questions um, that, you know, until I think we get better answers around them, they do sort of serve as barriers. Well, there's also uh, researcher sensitivity to releasing their, 
they're right. studied prematurely as well. So there's confidentiality right. issues relating to the researcher as well. As far as, um, you know, I think that some of these concerns about uh, fear of the reaction of the patient are largely unfounded. Mm -hmm. I know that, uh, you know, Dan and I experienced that like decades ago, that, oh, what, what's going to happen if a patient sees a lab result before the doctor, you know, and we had to implement a whole triage to mm -hmm. handle those emergencies. And, you know, patients are, patients can take it. Or, okay. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's an unfounded fear. And, maybe and some is finding people. I mean, there's some basic logistics. Okay, I have, and I'm, gonna, I'm sorry on your first name, Gon Gon Gonzalo, okay, please. Yeah, so the, the I comment I had is that, uh, you know, a lot of the time things like the consent process, <coughs> uh, you know, they have an original goal which is to inform patients and let them, you know, agree to participate and they've been subverted to, you know, basically satisfy the lawyers, you know. So we have this experience that we have consent forms that are 15, 20 pages long and that, you know, basically no one takes the time to read, you know, even though the information is there, it's only in theory. And, uh, you know, we had this experience where we set out to try and do a consent for our biobank that had only one page. And when we went back and asked people, you know, a month or a few months later, hey, do you know what you signed up for? The people who used the long form didn't know what they signed up for. And even though the consent rate was a little lower with the really short form, at least we could tell, you know, people knew that they were signing up for risks with data being shared and things like that. And so I think we, we need to make sure that we're doing these things, you know, if we say it's for patients, that it ends up being for patients rather than kind of protecting the health system lawyers or whatever it turns out to be. I'll tell you a quick story on that. Um, I, last year I participated in a study that had things in the fine print and, you know, the, the thing that you got in return was not your data, it was a T-shirt but they were gathering genomic data. And within the consent form, it talked about giving our social security numbers over to uh, the company that gen did my genetic testing, and I don't think that's right. You know, I think when we do a good job, we have things like sharing settings, where it's easy to understand, it's visual, it's something that we can change and opt out of over time. Um, but, you know, that, that shouldn't happen, and I think it's going to be a, a hard thing to, to deal with. The, the key to me is asking what patients want to do to consent, what different levels are in that A-B testing to make sure that we're deciding, you know, what is more effective for consent and what creates mm -hmm. a better data set. Okay, I have 10 people on my list, so I'm going to try to make more succinct. And yeah, I'm also going to comment on your, your, your question. Consent forms are broken. I think we all realize that. And we, there definitely needs to be a lot of attention paid to that. And I mean, I, not only here. And I think there's a big risk if we get this wrong with a big national study right. that we could create a backlash against, hey, you shouldn't do these kinds of things because you're tricking people or misleading right. them and so on. Dr. Patrick. Uh, Kevin Patrick, uh, UCSD, but uh, we're, ch we're using different forms of communication. I just got this from John Madison via text message, so I'm channeling John Madison here. Uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act only addressed discrimination against ind individuals for health insurance, but not long-term care, disability, or life insurance. Since Dixie already asserted accurately that re-identification is pretty easy to do from date of birth, gender, and zip code, who is going to champion protection from these other sources of risk so that our assurances to participants are valid? So, um, and there's actually quite a few people like Kathy who worked long years with me on the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, of course, we let go some things in order to get that bill passed and to get the core piece of the insurance and employment done, health insurance. Um, so those other two, through two or three systems like long-term care and, and life insurance are much more risk-based and underwriting is based on them for lots and lots of reasons, not just genetic information or, uh, or health information. In fact, yesterday somebody asked me at the Alzheimer's summit, can't we also have biomarker protection? So if, you know, if my brain is filled with amyloid, am I going to get um, discriminated against in employment? Um, so I don't think we have a good uh, societal answer to that because I think it's deeply, deeply rooted in the mess that our healthcare system is in and the fact that our insurance is tied to our employment and is not a right 
So I don't know how in the context of this we would make a difference except to say, again, we want people to go in with eyes wide open. And probably if we started to see enough discrimination around in certain ways, there would be a groundswell enough for those of us who are activists to activate again around these issues, albeit it's much harder in the kind of Congress we have today. Jim? Jane, isn't that your name? Yeah. <laughs> Jim, Austell. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Call him by a number. Hello. At this point. Your time. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Will someone help him? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I thought it was. I thought it was off the list. I, uh, you know, it's. No, I've, I've brought everybody down here. <laughs> Um, well, so I, I have to think of which of the many questions I didn't get called on I get a chance to ask. But um, I, actually, what, what I was thinking when you, uh, the, uh, the group was talking about being engaged from the beginning, one of the dominant things that I keep hearing from researchers actually in this room <coughs> is, what is this initiative about? You know, why are we here? Why is this one different from any other initiative? Is it going to have a million people does it mean it has more power? You know, what's, what's the difference? And at least what I hear, the big difference is, is direct patient engagement. And um, if that's really the big difference, then um, perhaps that's where the priority should come from, is the people that choose to engage, uh, you know, what are they interested in, in terms of the questions? Comments that short comments to the that comment? Yes. A little a little longer than that. <laughs> Pearl, Pearl is always bossing me around for years now. Um, so Jim, I think yes. I mean I, I can't answer um, why I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo now. Um, I'm not sure why, um, I, mean, I can't answer for the whole reason why we're here, because I think we're, I think this is a group process, which is a good thing, uh, and together we're deciding what is this, uh, and more will come. But I do think participant engagement from the start is a really like big, big piece. Okay. I also think the participants should really be the ones to address this whole, all of these questions about consent. Uh, I certainly agree that consent is badly broken, and I, I personally would like to see consent uh, made a verb instead of a noun. I think we think of it as a signed piece of paper instead of a, an ongoing process where people give the permission to use their, themselves and their data. Okay, Mark has a second short question. Yes, uh, you know me well. Um, <laughs> This is a, a brief speech disguised as a question. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who would have the, thunk? Uh, th th there was a high profile case last year where um, there was a, a, a deliberate uh, re identification uh, in a large data set for which the consent to use really says you're not supposed to do this. And yet, as best as I can determine, there really weren't any consequences associated with that. So thinking about fair information practices, and I know that we'll also have a data access for researchers session tomorrow. The question that I would have is within the context of this project, is it possible to not only uh, define up front what the rights and responsibilities are in terms yes. of accessing data, since we know that it's not going to be impervious to attack, but what would be the consequences if someone were to uh, violate what we consider to be the agreed upon fair practices? How could we create that within this project? So data access should be our right. Our, my genome should belong to me. Um, I think the hurdles right now from the regulatory side are we have these very first like small steps towards recourse, but they're not real yet. I'll give you an example. Um, in HIPAA laws now, as of October, allow for patients to request their direct re record set, and um, that also includes their genomic data. So we've got a small group of patients who have gone to Myriad and asked for their data, and the answer was no. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, now we have to trudge through all of these steps to get the data back. You know, another example of where that access rule works is in the blue button. But we don't, as patients, really have a way to, to quickly get that access back or any recourse or any sense of rights. Um, you know, I mean, the Office of Civil Rights is doing a lot. There's a few steps forward, but I think there's a long way to go. And if you look in my list of regulatory updates that need to be made, that includes, you know, making sure that 
data access and equal access as part of things like CLIA certification or as part of these research cohorts funding criteria need to be upheld. And Mark, I think you're also asking, should there be a Hippocratic Oath equivalent for researchers or something like that? And I think that we do want to think about what are, what's the social compact we have with each other when we do enter into studies and then you, maybe you obey the letter of the law, but you do something that then has no ramifications beyond it being interesting. I, I think the, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is a good thing to look for, uh, look at with, res, with this respect because um, they have developed a framework, um, a ethical framework of ethical behavior within the Global Alliance and, you know, this is every, you know, most countries are involved in the Global Alliance and it's not a top-down governance at all, but all of these countries have signed up for this code of ethical behavior, will participate in sharing data in accordance with these rules and the enforcement is really watching each other and if there's misbehavior to report it and as a more of a social, you know, social engine that comes, comes to, the foref to the forefront and uh, you know, takes action rather than a top-down enforcement. So I think that's, it, it certainly hasn't been proven to be effective, it's new, but at least it's, it's an example of, of what. The, yeah, sort know. of a, a scarlet letter approach, but yeah. I mean, CMS has a very different take on that, which is if I do something, you know, in the fraud and abuse in Medicare, I am excluded from Medicare participation, you know, for up to 10 years, and that essentially ends my medical practice, uh, because to get credentialed, <coughs> I have to demonstrate that I don't have any restrictions related to, to participation in Medicare, and, and I think that the social shaming is not sufficient for certain individuals. Right. I agree. Socially shaming frequently doesn't work. Um, we have a follow-up from the web. We do. We have a follow-up on that from um, WebEx. So how can we prevent for-profit companies from hoarding proprietary data and impeding research? I have a lot to say on this. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, I think the first thing is it starts with a cohort like this. I mean, we're creating a research commons, and that levels the playing field, and that's something I'm really, really excited about. Um, the problem right now is companies don't have an incentive there to share. There's nothing in it for them, so why would they do it? It takes too long, um, mm -hmm. it costs them money, and there's no real reason for them because they think that it won't benefit the patient or the participant. So I think, I, I, you know, I don't have a changeable idea for her <coughs> actually changing that other than giving us real recourse beyond the hoops that we have to jump through today. The other thing I'd just add is I don't think hoarding is uh, a special characteristic of the for-profit realm. I think, <laughs> I think it happens everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, Sue, Sue? You had a, you had a question before? Oh, okay. I had blue shirt, blue shirt next to you. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Harlan Krumholtz. I'm from Yale. I just want to make a quick comment that I think it is an important juncture that we're at with regard to how this would be developed. And the question is whether the group would really have the courage to make um, the people who would be active participants co-creators in this effort. That is, whether or not we're really ready to turn a page and say that there, there isn't a we, them, but there's just an us, and it's an our cohort um, the question was whether or not the patient-powered research networks have, uh, have achieved their promise yet. The vision is being set out, but we're still early in trying to develop the ways in which that will happen. So I, don't, I think it's unfair to actually say whether that's right now. But this represents a way to say this is going to be differentiated from what any other country has done, what any other large-scale study has accomplished. Because I think otherwise we're in danger of just being just another large cohort study that's attempting to collect a lot of data on a lot of people. And the question is, will there be some special nature to this, some property of it, so that, yeah, you can say honestly to people up front, it is impossible to fully protect data in this day and age. It is just impossible. But instead of scaring everyone off and saying only 1% of people are going to come into that, you're, you're, the group is saying that to each other. So how do we deal with that problem if we want to use our data to help solve our problems and also ensure that the next generation is going to be able to build on the knowledge that was generated from our participation, our work together, our holding hands together in order to learn as much as we could from ourselves. 
And then that citizen science gets turbocharged because you say, we want to work with the very best scientists in the world. So this isn't a matter of putting people who are amateurs at science. These are people who are experts in themselves and they're experts in the kind of issues that are important to them so that you say people have different levels of expertise. How do we link all of that and say we are all equals in this partnership in which we are trying to create an enterprise that's going to create knowledge faster, better, cheaper than has ever been done before because it's being done in complete partnership of a community of people working together. And I think that's a very important juncture because for $130 a person, the only way this works is if people are members of this. They're not participants. In, and I, I want to give Sally here because Sir Lean Dover, we were talking about this is a membership idea. Everyone's member of this larger enterprise to generate knowledge together. That's going to deflect against the, any sort of political issues that come up downstream. It's going to deflect against issues of consent and, and all these issues because they're all members. They all want to work together. And the end goal together is generating the knowledge that's going to be useful to them as a community. So I, I just I want to pose that to us because I think if you start orienting in that direction, I think the entire country could get excited about that. Because now all of a sudden this has a distinctive nature to it coordinated by NIH, brought in by the energy that people can do, and the only issue is going to be governance. Because with a million voices, how do you manage that governance, right? So that's a challenge. That's going to be a challenge. But anyway, I just want to say as I hear this and also say that also was an idea for the Patient Power Research Network, so just getting started there, but patient powered, patient's not a good word. Let's figure out another word. But this is joint membership all around a circle, around people with different levels of expertise and knowledge who, are who have a joint commitment to say in 10 years from now, we're going to know a lot more than we know today because we work together, and then the next generation is going to be way better off because we figured out a way to do that. To me, technical problems are easy to solve. Social, sociological, the trust, the issues in the middle, hard. Mm -hmm. We solve that, we will, victory is within sight. Technical, we can overcome. Working together, no one's done this yet. <laughs> and that's what I, I really see as the prospect here in something Obama can have as a legacy if we do this. Not that there was another study, not even another million person study, but it was a different kind of study, a different kind of science, and it was more effective, faster, in generating the knowledge we needed. I'm going to let that statement stand on its own. Yeah. Um, to let you know I've been very fair, Francis, it's your turn. <laughs> and yes, I did put my hand up a long, long time, time ago. <laughs> I put a few people ahead of you just to make you sweat. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. To demonstrate your objectivity. Well done. Uh, well, I wanted to press this very thoughtful panel a little bit more about exactly how do we, in this model, which I really like and I appreciate what Harlan is saying about members maybe instead of even participants, okay. but someone has to present that perspective and, and we probably can't enroll seven billion people on the planet uh, to provide the input about how we should design and implement this study. We probably can't enroll a million people and we don't even know who they are yet. And oftentimes those who come forward to take this perspective uh, of the future members are motivated because of a specific experience uh, of a medical problem in themselves or in their families. But Really what we're looking for here is for people who can leave that at the door and think about the big, broad spectrum uh, of questions that we hope to be able to answer uh, through this very large scale effort. And I agree, we, the only way this will be successful is if that voice is not just at the table, it's designing the menu, whatever the, the metaphor is. But where do we find those voices that actually credibly represent all of those uh, for whom they are speaking, because there's no hierarchy that I know out there where you can sort of <clears throat> point your finger uh, to organizational structures or associations or people who've been elected to hold this position. Uh, and I think this is actually a hard problem. Uh, you want to be credible in every way, but it's not trivial to see how to achieve that. So um, yeah. those of you on the panel have encountered this situation before. You've probably seen cases where it was done well and places where it was done badly. What should we do this time? So can I ask why not go to the people, and we won't call them patients, who are already changing the face of research through their own work? 
you know, they know how to collect and gather data. I think Sherrod is an example of this. She's been in it a lot longer than I have, and I've only been in it a couple of years, and there's a learning curve. But, you know, you find those leaders. There's a difference between 